Well, thank you so much again for uh, for joining us today. Up next, we have a wonderful fire, fireside chat with Julie Dawson and Stephen Voslow uh, to discuss the current landscape of virtual worlds for children. And as they are working their way up to the stage, I'll just give you a little bit of background on both of them. Uh, Julie leads a regulatory leads regulatory and development relations for Yoti's digital identity program, developing policy approaches for fraud prevention and safeguarding liaising with national security and sectoral trust frameworks in conjunction with Yoti's international external ethics boards. Julie is an authority in digital identity politics, ethics, and governance. She represents Yoti at numerous fora, including the World Economic Forum, Global Coalition for Digital Safety, and Digital Identity Innovators. We protect Global Alliance, the Tech UK Public Sector and Digital Identity Boards, Sprite Plus Network Security, Privacy, Identity, and Trust Engagement Network, the IEEESA Children's Advocacy Advisory Group, and the OSTIA Online Safety Tech Industry Association. Uh, joining Julie is Stephen Voslow, a technology policy and innovation specialist at UNICEF, Global Office of Research and Foresight. He works at the intersection of children digitalization policy covering issues such as children and AI, digital literacy, digital misinformation, the metaverse, neurotechnology, data, and inclusion. With 20 plus years experience in innovating digital technologies for social good, he has been head of mobile uh, head of mobile in the innovation lab, Pearson, South Africa, led the mobile learning program at UNESCO and held the prestigious fellowship for 21st century learning at the Shuttleworth Foundation. I am incredibly excited uh, to hear this fireside chat, and I'm looking forward to learning uh, from our wonderful hosts with all of you. reports that Stephen is still trying to get to the experience and in the interest of time Julie I would love to continue this discussion with you I know you and Stephen has prepared let's wait for Stephen if he's able to join us but in the meantime I really want to welcome you to take on the stage with us while we wait for Stephen uh, first of all um, Congratulations on getting this remarkable technology that you've developed at YOT to provide us uh, age verification for Instagram, which is used by millions of children. And it is, uh, I, I would love to straight away dive in. How is your technology potentially helping children stay safe online? And if you could unmute yourself, Julie. I can't hear you. Julie, if you could unmute yourself somehow. No? Okay, hold on. Let me just short that. Now try, please, Julie. Yourself. Or you could even click hand raise button so I can patch you in straight to a camera. You click on the hand raise button. You should be able to talk now. The hand raise button one more time. Let's try this again. Are you able to talk now? Unmute. Yes. Still can't hear you. I think there is an issue at your end about the audio. Sure. 
um, Sorry, everyone. While we try to resolve the issues, very technically event. So these things happen sometimes. Unfortunately, we're not able to get our speakers. To, uh, um, Julie, if you want to log back out and log back in and test your audio, we'll be on standby for you. And I would love for Ben and Laura to potentially take on this stage. I know you understand the topic. You are the, one of the experts, the current landscape of virtual world for children. Potentially, maybe enlighten us with your knowledge while we wait for Julie. Is that okay? Absolutely. Then you're okay to join Laura? I am here. Sorry, I stepped away for I stepped away for a second to use the restroom. What do we need to do? Uh, essentially, we have technical difficulties for this panel. It's on the topic of current landscape. Of I can't imagine any other person could kind of give us some insights while we are waiting for. Ah, uh, okay. Sorry, Kavya. Uh, I was reading the messages from Stephen Zoslo. We need to reset the space because he's stuck uh, at the end of okay. the space. Okay, we need to reset the space then. They inform okay. Carlos and then yeah, we exactly. need to reset the space. Okay. Okay. Sorry, guys. We Are we going to get a <laughs> kick here? Yes, for one second, please hold on to your headsets and your uh, desktops and everything because we're going to just reset the scene we'll be right back i hope that's okay with you because and we're back while we wait for our speakers uh ben and laura please uh, okay Let's see if we can get our speak. Otherwise, uh, I'm going to rely on you to potentially uh, help us with the current landscape of virtual world for children. Should arrive in minutes, in seconds. Okay. Sure. So it looks like we're holding for a couple for them to come in. Yeah, uh, just a couple of minutes. Okay. okay. Well, I think I, I think a great place to start uh, for if we're going to just have a general discussion about where where is, you know, the the virtual world landscape right now for mm -hmm. children. I think that there's there's from my experience in in gaming, there's always three places my mind goes immediately. We have Minecraft, we have Roblox, and we have Fortnite, right? Uh, these sure. are the mm -hmm. these are the yeah these are the virtual worlds that I see um, the the most play happening in, um, and some of them do excellent jobs uh, keeping people safe. Some of them are just kind of out there, um, mm -hmm. but you know these the, these places that are sort of built for play have become areas where uh, more <laughs> I would argue that more regulation is needed uh, in order to protect these kids. Uh, oh, sure. You know, there, there are so many studies, so many conversations about how people use these online spaces um, <clears throat> to get into kids' lives in ways that their parents wouldn't want. Um, mm. So when we're looking, when we're looking at the current landscape, I think that we're we're looking at a space where we've seen, uh, you know, a consumer-driven growth of an entire industry, uh, and in that pursuit of profit, uh, unfortunately, we haven't seen really strong guide rails put in. At the beginning, um, Fortnite just announced, I believe, a few days ago uh, that they're they're launching essentially, uh, you know, child friendly servers for people to play on, which is an excellent step forward, in my opinion, uh, for keeping people safe, getting age verification and allowing allowing kids to play with each other inside of environments with only other kids, which is 
it, I mean, it's an essential part of our development process as people. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, coming from a background working with at-risk populations, these are kids that are we're just kind of raising ourselves. Um, we're very curious. We're going to try to get through age verifications and, and things yeah. like that. Um, you know, I'm focused a lot on social media in terms of influencers and what sort of who, who are our children's role models today and who are they choosing to kind of spend their time emulating? Um, what behaviors yes. are they espousing and picking up? Um, in public safety, obviously, we're, we're dealing with a lot of endangerment um, or crime that's even committed by kids. Um, we're seeing trends showing up on social media like TikTok um, that's driving behaviors that we've probably, we, we wouldn't have seen maybe 15 years ago um, in terms of car theft and uh, all sorts of other things that are not great behaviors that we want to parent out of a child um, mm -hmm. or have an institution, an, an educational institution or something help guide that child with. So we're really especially with these at-risk kids who we're most likely to see in the criminal justice system. Um, we're really kind of leaving them out there to dry a little bit. Yeah. Um, and we need to be more mindful and thinking about what kind of, what kind of social pipelines are we creating and facilitating and enabling with this at the cost of, you know, advertising to young users and building their dependency or, you know, their loyalty to a brand. Um, they're also building loyalties to other brands that are not regulated or, uh, or you know, moderated. And that's something that we need to be mindful of. I saw our hand raised out here. No? Yeah. Yes. Um, one of the things that I noticed as a clinician working with kids is that and using digital tech and using digital technology in um, the therapeutic setting is that working with the generational age gap of mm -hmm. using the technology okay, i may have lost her audio a little bit here but i think someone keeps muting me i'm not sure what's going on um sorry no that's okay um but from a clinical perspective, using um, educating the parents and the caregivers of these are the ways that can keep it safe. Because what I see happen is that parents and caregivers, oh, I don't understand that because I didn't grow up with that. So and it's too frustrating to learn. So I'm just going to mm -hmm. let them do it. Not as not as um, a, a neglecting, but as a fear. Right to actually be involved in it. Yeah, to your point, I think it's important to recognize that looking to a company to provide that knowledge is not gonna be something that's necessarily brand aligned um, for them. Yeah, um, we, we don't tend to yeah. discuss the non-happy path or the risks and we're trying to sell a solution, um, especially to kids. We're trying to engage them and, and kind of bring them into a community. Um, so to your point, and where is that knowledge and information coming from, um, which is why groups like XRSI's Child Safety Initiative exists, is it's, we think it's very important to have a, a collective group of regulators, technologists, parents, educators, folks like yourself who are working directly with children, tell us sort of what we need to be thinking about as a collective group, um, rather than folks that have competing interests at play, because really when it comes to child safety and well-being, there shouldn't be conflicts of interest. We should all be hopefully aligned on that. Um, so yeah, we hope to continue this conversation and understand what materials would be useful for folks like yourself and what you think parents could benefit from, um, from these technology providers. Anything Ben to add on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think you, I think you covered it. Um, when it comes to the, the practical side of things, you know, my recommendation when talking, uh, with parents is that they're as, as we've, we will continue to learn the more we listen, there are so many spaces now that require our awareness. Laura brought up uh, influencers, which is like an entire market of people who are competing for, uh, you know, the attention in general. And then, of course, that includes the uh, the market of the attention of children. And just, uh, you know, I think one of the best safeguards that you can put up, um, one of the base that you can kind of put up as a parent is your level of knowledge. Um, about this space. A little bit goes a long way. A simple search of like, who are the top 10 Minecraft YouTubers? Who are the top 10 
you know, Fortnite YouTubers, the, the, that sort of information will give you a lot more knowledge about what the experiences your, your child's having online, and who they're watching. And it'll allow you to sort of intercede and parent in a way uh, that's informed uh, without sort of coming in surprised. Like, I can't believe that this person said this thing online. Um, if mm -hmm. you're aware of an influencer's past history, things that they've said, you can be prepared for those discussions uh, instead of sort of being caught flat footed. Hey, Ben and Laura, um, seems like we have Julie with us. I would really Wonderful. appreciate Welcome. if you could include her in your conversation. Julie, of course. go on stage, amplify your voice, and please unmute yourself. Thank you. Can you hear me okay now? Hello? We can yes. hear you very well. Lovely. Thank you so much. Real pleasure to be here with you. Absolutely. Yes. Well, let's continue the conversation, Julie. I don't know where you were able to kind of chime in and listen to what we're talking about. We had a great question uh, from the audience from Fiona about how we can kind of leverage uh, parental education and get information directly to you know the folks who are working directly with children and obviously parenting children to keep them safe online. If there's anything you can contribute to that, that would be great. So one of the things that we've been looking at is how to educate both young people and parents, educators, um, wider civil society about how age assurance can enable safe um, experiences online and age appropriate experiences. One of the things we've tried to do is build materials in very straightforward plain language that don't require to have a PhD um, in, in any topic. And that's one of the things that I think is, is very much in need for um, both young people and parents and educators to understand what are the options? How can they be both privacy preserving? How can they be convenient? Um, and how can they also be inclusive, which is obviously so important of people around the world, different ages, skin tones and genders? I would be very curious if you could provide an example of what that would look like for a child's experience online. Certainly. So if you look at the moment um, on sites like Yubo, for instance, um, they're looking to see how can they enable people to have an age appropriate experience in a teen zone, 13 to 17, or in an adult mm -hmm. zone, 18 plus. Um, take the instance with Instagram, they're looking to see if somebody is changing their age from under 18 to over 18, is this actually an adult? Um, mm. So we have a, a range of different ways that people can prove age. And one of the things that we wanted to do was to enable that to be also inclusive for people that don't own a government issued identity document. Over a billion people on the planet don't own a government document and others might not have access to a document. It might be that it's looked after by a parent or looked after by um, a spouse. And in that instance, how can they prove age? So we devised an AI approach a facial age estimation that isn't recognizing anyone. So it's just detecting a face, assessing that face, giving an estimate and deleting the image. And we were able to build that through the identity part of Yoti, through the reusable digital identity app, we, of which we've set up over 13 million with 190 countries around the world. And that was how we accessed this really unique data set to be able to have a ground truth of images with month and year of birth. So that when the AI sees a new image, it does a pixel level analysis, assesses the age and can delete that image. So that's the approach that we've rolled out with, for instance, Yubo. We've rolled out similar approaches um, through Instagram and now with Facebook dating. And one of the exciting things I think in the future will be how do you enable people maybe in a gaming environment where you have di different skill levels, but to have different age appropriate experiences pay playing the same game. And that's where I think we're going to get to in the coming years. That's wonderful. Thank you for that. For folks who are listening and who may not be familiar with what differentiates the metaverse from more traditional online experiences, could you help us understand that a bit in terms of what additional risks children might be facing in the metaverse? So I think obviously there's going to be very many additional benefits and possibilities. So I don't think we should overlook those. So, you know, classically, if you look at people with disabilities, um, there's some incredible work being done with people with spinal injuries. There's, incredible educational, ed tech and STEM learning opportunities. But you're right, um, through the immersive environment, you could have harms specifically also with haptics in terms of all the classic risks we've previously come across, the contact, the conduct, 
the contract and content. But those can be magnified. And I think one of the things that um, we're cognizant of is learning the lessons we've had of how in the past years, companies have started to look at their risk assessments, started to look at the positive, the negative, the intended and the unintended consequences of the environments they create. And I think over this next period, with all the emerging children's codes, the, the different legislation coming through in California, the Digital Markets Act, Digital Services Act, companies are looking at how do they create environments where people can thrive, but also look at some of those risk mitigations. Um, so looking at how do you turn off advertising late at night, turn off geolocation, turn off notifications, if you know that that is age inappropriate. If that's a five-year-old, should that five-year-old be streaming live to adults? What should be the support that you provide if you know this is a five-year-old and how do you differentiate that than support you might provide to um, an adult? So there's a lot of different things you can do once you know it's a child that makes that environment age appropriate. And I think we need to move away from the thought of age gating and blocking people out of experiences to more thinking, how do you create rich experiences which are age appropriate? I like that. That's, that's truly, uh, I feel like that is something that that's always been sought after in online experiences is being able to take that that playground experience, right? When you go to a playground as a kid, you're playing with other kids your age, and it's so hard to to set things up in a way where that is facilitated online. Um, what are some things that are happening right now in the space that are leading towards that sort of facilitation? So I think there's some very good work happening with the World Economic Forum's Global Coalition on Digital Safety, bringing together academics, policymakers, companies, practitioners, child safety, inclusion, all, you know, all manner of different experts. And in quite a few different parts of the world, you're seeing collaborative groups. Um, I'm part of one called Sprite Plus, which has 300 different academics of all different disciplines in the UK. Um, there's another body that I'm um, part of that's across law enforcement, working together with child safety and also with platforms. And I think we'll see more of these collaborations. Similarly, we've seen the Australian eSafety Commissioner, Julie Imran Grant, working with the Irish, the UK, and wider um, data protection bodies. And what would be great would be to see more of those cross-country collaborations. I think the work obviously being done in California will be hugely important here in, in the US. And what we need to see is how across civil society, as well as across the regulatory and various bodies, we're joining up to learn the lessons, as you've said, from 2.0, 3.0, and ensure that we're looking at each different level in the stack. What are the, the elements we can provide to enable people to thrive? And, you know, you mentioned the playground experience. Often it was playing with people that might be a little older, a little out of comfort zone that were introduced, but in a facilitated um, environment. And I think that's some of the things that we don't want to lose the richness of. And yet we do want to provide the safeguards. So we have to look also at the anonymity, pseudonymity, verification levels. If you look in metaverse experiences, we have to look also okay. at how tokenization and currencies could become liquid. So some of the different game elements that have been happening in today's world, how do those evolve? And how do we enable people with assets um, and ownership how do we enable those structures and the laws from today's world to evolve going forwards with extraterritoriality? So many different angles um, to, to cover in a, in a short uh, range period. Truly. Well, thank you so much uh, for, for joining us. We apologize for the, the technical difficulties, but you have, your, everything that you've said has been so incredibly insightful. Um, and we'd encourage anyone who's watching, please make sure to, to connect with any of any of the speakers who are here today. If you have further questions we didn't get to during this period of time, we're gonna take a quick break uh, and then we'll be back with our next panel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julie. Appreciate your time.